Same thing with errors. Oh, yeah. Errors are not the way to actually get somebody observing it. And uh, whether or not the experiment is actually watching over the shoulder of a patient as we go is uh, something that you don't have to keep track of very well. I would write it in notes so that people don't really pay attention to it. It's probably used to talk about a lot of other things. Could be. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call it a time, I wouldn't call it a time effect. The time sound, this, yeah, the time sound's a little bit on the strong side. How we doing back there? Good? Good? Okay, great. Okay, welcome back to the weekend, everybody. Just, uh, just a couple quick housekeeping things. Um, the 
class will now have the slide capture associated with the audio for those of you who want to torture yourself and listen to this twice. It's available. I tried to get live video, um, which I think would have been nice, but they can't do it in this room. So, you know, basically that's, uh, that's where we're at. So I thought what I'd do um, is start just with a really quick couple minute, five minute review of some of the high points so far that we've gone over in this part of the class where we're really trying to get into understanding the various methods that you can use to study the human brain. So of course the course is focused on using the neuropsychological approach, which is looking at patients with specific brain lesions or degeneration in certain areas with specific behaviors. Trying to understand brain behavior relationships, whether it's the medial temporal lobe and Alzheimer's in memory or perisylvian areas in the left hemisphere in language. That's the core of the course. And of course, we have to get there. We need to know how to measure things. And if we went over the classic work in 1858 by Paul Broca, which of course, whoops, now I have to, which one is this supposed to do? What did we say we wanted? Whiteboards? Whiteboards, right? Let me see if I got it right. No. Uh, it's not presentation mode. There we go. go. Is that okay? Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, thanks. Which one is it? Computer mode. Famous case of Paul Broca pointing out the uh, involvement of anterior parts of the frontal lobe in language production. Later in the course, we'll actually get into this in more detail, we'll understand that Broca, although he was, had the right general concept, was actually wrong in terms of the function of Broca's area. We then talk a little bit about the famous case of John Harlow, country physician in Massachusetts, Phineas Gage, an unfortunate railroad man who had a rod actually go under his left jaw, come out the top of his head, and had severe damage in his orbital frontal and uh, left amygdala area with resultant changes in behavior, very salient to understanding how you do social emotional interactions, how you read people, how you adjust your behavior. Really, these were two very early seminal cases. In the, we talked a brief, a presaging what we're gonna do in the clinical part of the course. We're gonna understand what a traumatic brain injury is. What areas of the brain does it usually get? What other pathologies affect the orbital or undersurface of the brain, such as this meningioma? We'll talk quite a bit about the lateral frontal cortex and cognitive control, more cold cognition, if you will, what you're doing here, pretty much. That can be affected by strokes. Here's a post-mortem of a hemorrhagic stroke. It could be infiltrating tumors, the worst form of tumor, glioblastoma, which doesn't have a boundary and just spreads. Degenerative disorders, which have really become quite prominent, uh, particularly since the tauopathies that you see in older age people with neurodegenerative disorders, also is the principal pathological finding in patients with chronic traumatic encephalopathy from repeated head blows. So this has become, as you know, beginning to become an emerging uh, healthcare crisis. And other things in the frontal lobe, here's an overgrown cortex. The cortex is too thick. It's a developmental abnormality, and uh, it is associated with intense abnormal neuro neuronal firing and is a big cause of seizures in kids. These little, they can be this big where it's obvious, everybody can see it. They can also be at the cellular basis when they're only really seen at post. You can't even pick them up, even with a seven Tesla scan. Yes? Uh, can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah? Okay, so what is going? So there must be something in the speaker system here. Let's see here. Volume controlled. Get up there. How about that? Did that do it? Okay, let me know right away if it's off. It's something with the, I think the speakers are not projecting evenly in the whole room. Um, and very, very, uh, very big source of epilepsy uh, in, in kids. So we'll get into that in more detail later in the course. We've gone through the major imaging modalities, uh, and we're about to finish today and the next day on intracranial recording and EEG and magnetoencephalography. We talked about the Rankin 
which is simply blockage of penetration of x-rays. Uh, and you can actually pick out the bones. We now use it routinely. As we discussed, many of you have had x-rays of broken bones, broken fingers, et cetera, et cetera. Here's a skull x-ray. You can see the hyperdense bullet, unfortunately, in this cranial vault. And here you can see an unfortunate uh, patient with actually injections uh, of nails into the back of their head. And you can quite, you can even see the fillings in the teeth there. So x-rays are quite valuable, by the way, here. For those of you interested, there's a big skull fracture that got fractured when the bullet entered the skull. Computerized axial tomography, which is used all the time because it's very helpful in the acute stage of any disease. Again, it's very sensitive to blood. MRI scan is not in the first several hours. If you fall off your bike and have a head injury and are, are unconscious, you are going. When you go into Altivate, you're getting a head CT scan. If you come in and you're somebody who's having the warning symptoms or the actual overt symptoms of a stroke, before you get a, any drug that may break up the clot, these TPA injectable drugs, which are very helpful in resolving clots and saving brain function, you're going to get a CT scan because the drugs that break up clots also predispose to bleeding, and you don't want to give that drug to someone who actually has blood in their head. So these are really, the CT scan is tremendously, uh, tremendously important. And as it's really just an upgrade of a regular x-ray. The x-ray has a source and a detector. And in CT scan, you just get lots of sources and detectors. You spin the ring around the head and acquire all kinds of data. And then you figure out, well, exactly what density here from every projection angle that we might get solves for the bone density, let's say, of my pinky, if that's what you were actually imaging. In our case, we're usually imaging head, but you can image many things with CT. We then moved on to MRI scanning. We talked about that the MRI scan requires a radio frequency pulse that flips a, a proton, and then the proton relaxes back. If it relaxes quickly, it doesn't signal any, it doesn't measure water. If it relaxes slowly, two and a half seconds, that's the relaxation time of water. We can use these different relaxation properties. We can use these different relaxation properties to get some index of where water is in the brain, and water, of course, accompanies many diseases. This one shows beautiful imaging of your venous structure. This is your venous draining structure. We then talked about how we can use other imaging techniques to actually get a gorgeous picture of your brain connectivity. Things don't happen in isolation. We're big, heavily wired, fast acting, parallel processing machines. The information routes on these fibers. In this case, red is left to right across the corpus callosum. Green is front to back, let's say frontal controlling posterior, and basically blue is actually coming from the motor strip down into your cortical spinal tract. We just color-coded them, but you can see how you can segregate intrahemisphere connectivity within hemisphere connectivity, communication to your spinal cord and to your body. Finally, we talked about fMRI scanning, which now gets us into the functional domain, which is extremely important for understanding human behavior. The prior tools are particularly helpful for neurological uh, and neurosurgical diagnosis. We talked about oxidative metabolic coupling, which means if your cells fire more, just like if your muscles is contract more, you need more oxygen and glucose to make it work. What happens is the cortex has the cells firing, you get increase in blood flow, and what we measure in fMRI scanning is actually an overshoot. The brain delivers too much oxygen, so you have too much oxyhemoglobin, not too much. I shouldn't say too much. Maybe there must be a reason for it. But there's actually an overshoot, and that's what we actually measure quite nicely. There's visual stimulation, visual fMRI activity, ramping up at four to five seconds. It's a sluggish but very spatially beautiful response. And when you are normal flow, when you're sitting and doing nothing, or maybe with your eyes closed, maybe half your, half your red cells have oxygen. When you get stimulated in this brain area, the, the vascular system is going to deliver more oxygenated hemoglobin, and that's the source of the signal uh, that we measure. Okay, so that's, and oh, finally, the last thing in terms of imaging, again, to go over one more time, is positron emission tomography, extremely powerful tool 
in clinical medicine now. It had started being used in brain science, but now it's really used for di diagnostic uh, purposes. Very powerful tool, really simple. You have a radio, you have a uh, unstable nucleus. The different nuclei can be from different tracer sources. This radioactive, this, uh, this uh, unstable nucleus decays into, emits a positron, basically, the decay emits a positron, which is an electrically, basically think of it as a positively charged electron. It doesn't travel very far. It runs into an electron. You have what's called an annihilation event, where you basically conserve charge because it disappears. You basically, you didn't add charge, it just disappears. And then the annihilation event gives off two <laughs> photons coming off at right angles. Again, and we detect with detectors where it's coming from. So if this detector, these two detectors fire simultaneously, it means that there was a source here. And so on, you can see, just like CT, then you reconstruct where that source is. And it's, we're going to be talking about this quite a bit when we talk about neurodegenerative disorders, because it's a very powerful tool for imaging Alzheimer's, uh, frontal temporal dementia, now sports or other forms of repeated trauma, traumatic, uh, traumatic brain injury, and so on. EEG 1929, Helmsberger developed it, isolated it, actually to the gray matter, said that maybe this signal could be used in his mind to differentiate psychiatric disorders. It actually never turned out to be true then, although it's getting closer to be true now because there's a wealth of information in your EEG. As we discussed, the EEG is being generated in, this, in the cortex of the brain, and we'll go through a few slides as to why that is. It turns out it has to do with the geometry of how cells are. In the cortex of your brain, your cells are lined up in parallel. So when they fire, all their activity sums. In many other parts of the brain, for instance, in the basal ganglia, the cells are more randomly distributed. So as they fire, their fields don't line up. They cancel out locally. So we don't pick up anything uh, on the surface of the brain. And this activity here uh, produces various signals on the surface of your brain, which we can, we can easily pick up and record. And they have a powerful connection to many behaviors, which I'll talk about in a little bit. EEG and MEG really provide what you need in terms of online cognitive functioning because we're all fast. Most of our decisions are made in less, in less than half a second. And the only way to really get at that is the temporal resolution of EEG and MEG. We talked a little bit about this baseball player. If he doesn't make a decision in 250 milliseconds to swing his bat, he can't hit the ball. The ball's passed up. So you can imagine how many processes are going on in that quarter second when you're making a decision. Is it a strike? Do I want to swing? Where do I think it's going to be? Let's pick this motor program. You did that all in a quarter second. It's pretty fast. And the people who do it a little bit faster, in general, are a little bit better athletes, <laughs> particularly a little bit better baseball players because they can wait to make the decision to swing if they can process the stimuli faster. So let's get into the gory details of the EEG and what generates your EEG as we sit in the room here, we all have an EEG. In fact, if you don't have an EEG and your, e your, your scalp EEG is flat, there's no electrical activity in the absence of being under heavy sedation or hypothermic um, or, or severely hypothyroid, if you have a flat EEG, you're clinically dead. And we'll talk about that later in the course when we talk about coma. So it is a very important thing uh, even on that basis. So here's your... Here's a pyramidal cell in your cortex. It's got a cell body, it's got an axon communicating somewhere, and it's got a dendrite. The dendrite shaft is where the action is. And we don't need to get into the details of you know, exactly uh, the sub-areas of the dendritic shaft. We can take that dendritic shaft and move it right over here. When we move it over here. For those of you who have taken any a, a biology course, you'll know that your, all your neurons are sitting at a resting membrane potential where intracellularly you're in the minus 60 to minus 80 millivolt range, basically. That's where you sit. And then when, that, when, you, get a, when you get a depolarizing event, of course, the, 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 the currents flow, and you switch acutely the local activity. So here's the top of your dendritic shift. It's sit, the whole thing before you excite it, 
is all negative. I put an excitation into here, and locally here, I now have switched. So now, instead of being negative inside the cell, inside the dendritic shift, it's actually positive. So what you've done here is by creating this negative positive switch here, you now have positive activity in the top of the dendritic shaft extracellularly and negative activity in the bottom part of the dendritic shaft. So what you've done is you've separated charge. Positive, negative, extracellularly. And when you, if you separate charge, that is called, what you've just created is an instantaneous dipole. A dipole is separation of charge. Okay, so that's what you've done. And we're not going to take that dipole, right? So we've gone from having the external part of the, of, the, of the dendritic shaft. Here's the dendritic shaft will be over here. We have positive at the top, negative at the bottom. So now you've separated charge. And by, by, um, by definition, current flows from positive to negative. So you're going to have an extracellular current flow pattern from the top of the dendritic, extracellular part of the dendritic shaft to the depth, current flow. And this is basic physics, which maybe some of you will jog your memory. When you have current flow, and these kind of current flow lines, at right angles to the current flow, you've generated an electric field. So here's your dendrite, here's the extracellular space instantaneously, current flows, and they're orthogonal to these uh, current flow lines, you've generated an electric field. So we're all generating these electric fields. That's basically what happens in your cortex. And if the electric field generation is right near the surface of the brain, we'll get a very tight distribution. And I'll show you about what this is in a minute. This is a near field. So, for instance, this would be something like if I'm trying to evaluate your spinal cord prior to surgery, and I want to get a, a measure of conductivity, I could basically electrically stimulate your foot or your hand, and I could drive your somatosensory system. I can actually record right from your somatosensory cortex very local field potentials. And this is even used intraoperatively if you're working on someone's spinal cord. Let's say you're putting in a, a rod for scoliosis or something. You want to make sure you're not over-twisting the cord. So very useful. So this is a near field generated by, you're picking up the electric. This is the electric field. Gener that is generated by the current flow, which has been induced by the postsynaptic potential hitting your dendritic tree. This, this electric field is picked up as a potential, a change in electrical potential over time on the surface of your brain with an electrode right here, pre-surgical stimulating your right hand. I put little wrist shocks on your wrist, and I record here, and that's how we get this potential on the surface of the brain. And EEG recording, and there's two ways to do this. Most is wired and wet, and that's the standard around the world. Uh, as I showed you begin earlier in the class, the first lecture in the class, there are many efforts to develop wireless and dry systems, which do everything is like this. They basically transmit 200 feet. They're, you know, basically... Uh, with, uh, uh, they transmit wirelessly. You can upload data to the cloud. Uh, if you think about it, it opens up a whole new vista in home monitoring. For instance, if you have a kid, and this, I just went through this, if you have a kid and they're not sure if he's having seizures, you, have, you can bring them into the hospital and do 24-hour monitoring, and I can just tell you it, that is not a pleasant experience for kids. Uh, it's just not. So if you could actually do it at home in batches of two-hour times while they're watching cartoons and they've got the headset on and you're just wirelessly sending it to the cloud and to the neurologist's office could be really fantastic. I also mentioned that this kind of system costs roughly sixty to $70,000 and it's largely inaccessible to two-thirds of the world for social, economic, and other reasons where this thing I think eventually could be manufactured for a couple hundred bucks, which means you could get... EEG accessibility to lots of people around the world who currently don't have it. So that's another positive. There's two kinds of what I just mentioned, evoked potentials. These are this is this potential that we're recording on the surface of the brain. The two broad kinds are something that's evoked. Evoked means stimulus driven, and I'll show you an example. 
The second kind is event-related. This has nothing to do particularly with the sensory thing which you've been delivered. It's what you do with it. Did you detect it? Did you decide to act? So the, if you want to think about it, you can also say this is externally driven brain activity, and this is internally generated brain activity. And most of the internal, you know, you can, they're heavily used clinically. Probably everybody in this, in this room, depending on what state you were born in, you didn't leave the hospital until they did a brain stimulatory evoked potential on you. It's standard in, in California, and the reason we do that is in the little baby, we don't want to send a baby home and it's got a hearing, an unknown hearing loss or hearing problem because you're basically setting that kid up to get a psychiatric diagnosis. They're not connected, they're autistic or whatever. So we really like to screen and I'll show you how we do it. It's really simple, it takes a couple of minutes and you get beautiful, you can tell exactly how their auditory system works. And then we'll talk, the cognitive potentials have to do with you doing something internally. So here, we could do a little quick exercise. And the most prominent cognitive potential is this detection potential, P300, positive, occurring at 300 milliseconds. This is where it is in the maximum on the posterior scalp. What I'd like everybody to do is look around the room and detect an exit sign. Find an exit sign. Can you find it? Okay, all right. Each one of you, at the moment you detected the exit sign, generated a P300 period, and it's preserved across the mammalian species. So this is a very elementary brain response to detection. It could be detecting the exit sign. It could be detecting something on the side. It could be detecting anything. It could even be generated to detecting something missing. So if I say to you, press a button whenever you hear a target tone, like beep, 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 boop, press a button, you get P300. Now I say to you, Press a button whenever there's a missing stimulus. So there's no sensory response at all. Beep, 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 beep. And you detect a missing stimulus, you still get the detection potential. So you're completely dissociated from any sensory input, period. There was none. So this is a beautiful separation between externally driven and internally generated. And you see later, this is very powerfully uh, used for uh, spelling programs in patients with very bad communication disorders. Now, I don't want you to even think you need to know these, this slide. I put it in there for the sake of completeness, just to show you the kind of things you can measure with EEG. I just told you I can measure your detection system. I can measure your system getting ready to act. You're getting prepared to take your free throw. By the way, did anybody see the Warrior Celtic game? One person? That's it? Two? Were you all warrior fans? Yes? Warrior, yeah. Wow, okay. Well, you were all studying for 117. I, I was at the game with my grandson, sorry. So arousal, error detection, you want to reach the pick up that can on the shelf, and you do that correctly every time, but that one time you go to reach and you pick up the wrong can, you say, well, I'm making a mistake. Your brain tells you you're making a mistake. Early potentials in your visual cortex related to a face. If I show you a face or a non-face. Motor potentials for you getting prepared to move. So there's a whole wealth of things that could be studied with EEG. Now, a couple core concepts about this. Signal averaging. What is signal averaging? Right. Signal averaging means you take a, something that's noisy. It's in, you can barely detect it because there's so much noise, and you keep repeating the event. And the noise is assumed to be random. So as you keep adding together random activity, it will eventually, the random activity will go to baseline. But the stimulus of interest continues to happen at the same time and sums up and is clearly seen emerging from the data. That's signal averaging, okay? The number of trials that you need to get a reliable response is really dependent on how big of the brain response you're looking at. For the brainstem evoked response, which you all had when you were babies, the response is only about half a microvolt. So you need to do a lot of trials to get a clean response, but you can do it quite quickly in a couple of minutes. Whereas the P300 response, when you all detected that 
exit sign, that could be 10, 15, 20 microvolts, quite robust. So you may not need very many trials to get a reliable response. And another very important uh, component of signal averaging, and the engineers will probably be quite familiar with this, is the signal, the signal to noise, how big your signal of interest is, it doesn't matter what it is. In our case, it's brain response. It could be you know, movement of a building in an earthquake. The signal compared to the background noise is the key. The bigger your signal to noise, the better. But at some point, adding more trials, more times of you detecting the exit sign doesn't really help because the signal to noise is proportional to the square root of the number of trials or stops. So if you think about it, it's not linear. So if I had you detect that exit sign 25 times, the signal to noise would be 5 to 1. But if I now have you detect it 36 times, which is almost a 50% increase in experimental time, if you will, your signal to noise is only 6. So you've added a whole lot more trials with very little improving signal to noise. So these are the things that people think about when you're designing these experiments. So here's a real world example. This is you when you were a baby, and you got one electrode on your vertex, and we're stimulating to record your brainstem auditory vocal potential, which we'll talk about when we talk more about in coma. In fact, to call someone brain dead, they can't they have to have their brainstem of vocal potential has to also be gone in addition to their EEG being flat. This is one trial, you don't see anything. Here's 16 signal noise. Uh, for you know, 64 trials, 144, we're beginning to see this emerge, but by 1,024 trials, we get a beautiful brainstem auditory vocal potential. Everybody in this room would get one, wave one auditory nerve on up to your, uh, uh, your uh, inferior colliculus, beautiful activity, highly reliable. It tells me whether or not your hearing apparatus works. If this is abnormal, you need to be seen by, you need to, you, other things need to be done, basically. Now you said, boy, a thousand trials must take forever, but because it's such a short latency response, this is five milliseconds, right? Five milliseconds, we give the stimulation rate at 11 per second, so it's like, it's done in two minutes, you get your thousand trials. You might, so it's pretty simple. Here, on the other hand, is the event-related potential, the P300. Here's two subjects. The first trial detecting the exit sign. This subject had such a big response, and you can see here's 10 microvolts. That's probably 30 or 40 microvolts. I can see it on a single trial. This subject, I couldn't. As I now go to four trials, nine, 16, you can see this robust potential uh, emerging because the background noise, all this stuff, all that stuff disappears. It averages out to random. And I can see by nine trials in both subjects, I can see a very reliable response. In fact, when we're using the P300 speller for patients with neurological problems of communication, you typically only need four trials. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So it's a, this is this idea of evoked versus cognitive size signal averaging. The other thing that's important is the geometry of where you, are, you think you're recording from. This, two con this, this is the concept. There's an open field, and there's a closed field. What does that mean? I mentioned it to you before. Let's say you're in some brain area, and there's two cells lined up, and they both fire at the same time, really tight, and they're lined up. Their extracellular fields are going to sum, and we're going to get this beautiful response. Let's take the same two cells, but in this case, they're lined up in opposite directions. If I put a single unit electrode in there, I'm still going to hear pop, pop, but because they're pointing in different directions, their extracellular fields will cancel, and I won't pick up any signal. And this is a limitation. So the geometry of the brain system determines whether or not you're going to be able to record that brain, that brain area on the surface of the brain. Again, here's a good example. Here's your cerebral cortex. Nice lined up pyramidal cells, ideal. This could be, for instance, your basal ganglia, lots of firing cells, but they're kind of in this interleaved network, and there's no perfect geometry to have summation of their extracellular uh, currents. Again, here's another one where, so if you put an electrode here, you pick up nothing, nothing, 
put an electrode here, you pick up a robust signal, even though they all have cell fire. So local geometry is uh, critically important. We talked about this before. Briefly, the near field means it's the generators right under the electrode, like your somatosensory cortex. The far field, this is your brain stem. What I just showed you, that five millisecond response that we all have that tracks our auditory brain stem system, it's deep in the brain stem. So the electric field is widely distributed. So you get your brain stem evoked response all over the surface of the brain, mainly here. That's about where the dipole is located. But we know it's not coming from the cortex. This is just the field generated by this activity <laughs> in your brain stem. Okay? Near field, far field, open, closed, postsynaptic potentials. So now we've talked about EEG and the biophysics of it, you know, kind of by, you know, kind of not, I wanna, wouldn't say elementary, but you know, pretty, pretty core um, central findings of what generates the EEG. And yet we either have evoked, you know, bang, respond, or cognitive, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna look for something. Oh, there's somebody in pigtails. Okay, I'm looking, I'm sorry to pick on you, but I was just trying to figure out something I would detect, and that's a good one. And I got a P300. That's cognitive. Now we're gonna talk about the frequency, the ongoing frequencies in your brain. So, you know, the kind of symphony of brain activity, underlying behavior. And so this is, the idea is this is Joseph Fourier, brilliant mathematician, this is old stuff mathematically. Ways to extract frequencies from an ongoing signal. What does that mean? If you go to a jazz club, and there's a trio playing, and there's a, there's a sax player, there's a piano player and a bass player. Your tympanic membrane, here's this nice response, right? This is the summation of all the frequencies they're emitting from their instruments. That's what you hear. But if I take this signal and I now do a Fourier decomposition, a little bit like decomp decomposing white light into its constituent frequencies, what I find is actually I have three different center frequencies. <laughs> I might have a higher frequency component that's related to the piano player, a little bit faster component that perhaps is related to the alto sax, and then a lower frequency component that's related to the bass. You have them all combined, but they're actually the summation of three distinct separate frequencies. And Fourier techniques allow you to extract out of your ongoing EEG all these different frequencies that you're generating with different frequencies being linked to different behaviors. And that's the key point. And that's where we're talking about it in this course. So here's an example of what we do a lot of in my lab, and we'll get into this a little bit more. This is a signal being recorded directly from the surface of the brain. And just so you know, you, for those who you didn't have a column at DSI, he was, because he was down at Irvine and recording from uh, two of these patients, actually. And this is the ongoing EEG. I put an electrode right on the surface of your brain, and I can use these signal analysis techniques. And I don't want to get into the details of the filtering, et cetera, but I can use mathematical things to extract in this signal where's high frequency activity, and there's a lot of high, a little high, a very low high, et cetera, a middle frequency, perhaps an alpha frequency in the back of your brain, and even a very slow frequency. So I can pull out of this ongoing EEG what signals are contributing to it? Perhaps if the person is asleep, one of the biggest signals contributing to this EEG will be power in the low frequency bands, right, in the theta and delta bands. And if that person is wide awake and, and, and thinking about things, you're going to see a drop in low frequency and an increase in high frequency activity. Because high frequency activity is the, is the frequency band that's directly linked to underlying single cell activity in the brain. It's a very powerful tool, okay? Oops. And again, here's a little corny movie, but I don't know, I probably, this just shows what we can do in real time, extracting different frequency bands from the ongoing EEG. We can break them down into whatever bands we want. In 1998, if you looked at the literature and you said, what are the frequency bands that everybody the maximum frequency bands that everybody in this room generate, the party line would be you don't generate anything in your cortex above 50 hertz. 
50 cycles per second. And they were broken up into delta and alpha and beta and this gamma uh, up to maybe 50 or so hertz. Turns out it's completely wrong. And in, I'll show you what we've discovered in the last 15 to 20 years in terms of what is really going on in your brain when you're doing interesting behavioral tasks. And it turns out, as you'll see, there's another frequency band we didn't know about that went from 50 to 250 that we couldn't pick up from the scalp EEG, which is all over your cortex. So as you're looking at this screen, your visual cortex is generating high frequency activity. As you're thinking about, should I, what, is that interesting? Maybe your frontal cortex. Should I remember it, your frontal cortex interacting with your hippocampus? Okay, so how do we get at this new signal space? Electrode placements. This is the scalp. Here's subcutaneous fat, and yes, you all have subcutaneous, your whole face is fat covered with skin. It's, I don't want you to think about that a little bit <laughs> in terms of. Then you have your cranium, then you have your dura mater, which is a tough membrane, and you can put electrodes epidurally, which means on top of the, uh, on, on top of the dura. Here's the dura mater, and here's, or you can put them subdurally, and this is what we do. We put electrodes subdurally under this area to try to localize seizure foci in people who have refractory epilepsy, which means they're not responding to medications. And I think we discussed this earlier in the course. In this country, that's roughly 450,000 people who don't are not well controlled with seizure meds because the incidence of seizures, excluding febrile seizures, we don't count those because those are self-limited to kids with a high fever, 1% of the population pretty much worldwide as a seizure disorder. When we do that recording, when we do this subdural recording, in 1998, it was reported by, in one patient from a colleague of mine at Johns Hopkins, Nathan Crone, that when he presented phonemes like ba, da, to this patient who had electrodes on, he recorded high frequency activity up to 100 hertz. That has opened up the floodgates. We subsequently published a few papers showing in a variety of tasks that you got high frequency activity actually up to 200 hertz. It's very reliable, and as you'll see later uh, in the course, it is what tracks <coughs> cognition, this high frequency activity, which you can think of as a surrogate for having an electrode in your cortex and actually measuring individual cells firing, because that's what it reflects, okay? Um, so. Let's go back to this intraop a little bit, because this is a fascinating story. This is the history of stimulation mapping. What's stimulation mapping? Well, surgeons, neurosurgeons, there's two areas that they don't want to injure during surgery. They don't want to injure motor structures, because they can have a perfect surgery taking out some thing, an AVM, a tumor, and they don't want the patient coming out paralyzed. They also don't want to they want to avoid going through language cortex. Right? Because if you have a really good surgery, you take care of the problem, but the person comes out with a speech deficit that's not good. And what they do intraoperatively is they actually map language in the cortex. Right? And the history goes back to stimulation, dog studies, the brilliant Ferrier, who I talked about, and I think even lecture one. Sherrington then started mapping out motor structures in primates, the brilliant Canadian neurosurgeon Wilder Tenfield, in Montreal, mapped out the famous homunculus and then extended his work to um, mapping out language in the operating room. And then he trained Ogeman, who's actually, was a, uh, he's retired now at, Wash at University of Washington, but his son, Jeff Ogeman, we actually collaborate with, and he's a, he's a pediatric neurosurgeon, and he does this kind of work also. So that's kind of the timeline of this development. And here's what, why we're doing it. I'm going to just show you a 30-second. This is a, a brave young woman who, had, uh, who basically had a brain tumor. And we, she, we want to take out the brain tumor, but avoid language. And the only way to do that is to first put her under, open up a craniotomy, wake her up, and do language tasks as we're tr we try to knock out different brain areas with an electrical pulse. Okay? This is reality, okay? I know it sounds a little strange, but this is what, this is what we do. And we want to do this to give this 
young woman the maximum outcome. So you can probably, you don't have to be a neuropathologist to see where the lesion is here, but we want to eliminate touch, taking out any language portion. Because the tumor is near a region of the brain that is involved in language. Damage a vital area, and Sarah might never speak again. To avoid this happening, Henry has to do something extraordinary. We've been going now for about an hour, and the critical phase is coming where they're going to have to remove the tumour. In order to do that, Sarah has to be awake. Sarah? Sarah? If you have a general anaesthetic, you can go into an operating theatre. So I'm not going to go through the whole tape. You can find it online. Basically, she wakes up. We always use a short-acting um, anaesthetic that basically you can put the person under very quickly, but you can stop it and bring them back to fully alert in maybe 20 or so, mid-25 minutes, because the patient must be awake to do language mapping. And here's what happens during the language mapping. Oh, I've got the slide up there. The patient's asked, let's say, to count. One, two, three, four. And while they're counting, you take an electrical stimulator, which basically puts current through the cortex and transiently disrupts the function of that area of the brain. Right? It's called stimulation, but it's actually not making anything happen per stimulation, you're shutting off brain cells. And if the patient is talking and they're going one, two, three, four, and I have an electrode here, and while they're talking, I put electrode through and they go one, two, three, and they can't talk, that's a speech output area, period. And that's how these, these, these data, these are data from Mitch Berger's uh, program over at UCSF, who's the chairman of UCSF, and we do a lot of intraoperative recording with him. He's quite uh, spectacular. Uh, surgeon, and his focus is mainly brain tumors, really a tremendously exciting program. Now you're in the, in, you're, now the patient's sitting there, they're awake, Sarah was awake, and you're showing your pictures and she, on a screen. We have, actually have a, a TV screen, and they have to name the picture. So up comes a picture of banana, she says banana. Up comes a picture of a set of keys, and as that key picture comes up, you put electrical stimulation, and she can't name it. She, she just has a hesitation, says, I can't get the name. That's a naming site. And those, if you notice, have a more widespread distribution, but tend to center in the back of the brain, close to Wernicke's area. So these are, these are from different patients, right? These are lots of patients. And of course, when you have an individual patient mapped out, you're actually going to online plan your surgical approach so that you avoid these brain areas. It's really as straightforward as that, not trivial to implement but done very well at most major neurosurgical centers. So here's an actual person being recorded. You feel some vibration, Susan. That's normal. We're going to get ready to do the mapping. What we do Good. is that's the name of it. You see seizure activity when you're seeing the brain, there's actually a, 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 a vial of ice water, and you see ice cold water on the floor. Right. And it shuts the cord back down, and you say, right. Why are you doing that? Well, if you get the person to set it to stop the seizures, you can't continue the mapping. If I put ice water on their cortex, the cortex is up and they're functioning again in, you know, 15, 20 seconds. So that's how it's done. We then go in and put high-density electrodes on for 10 or 15 minutes if the patient agrees. This is Eddie Chang, who had worked in the lab. He's now a very successful neurosurgeon at UCSF. And you can see this high-density electrode, and then we would do some of our studies we're trying, what we're trying to do with Mitch is develop a speech decoder that we could have an implantable speech decoder for someone who can't speak, but they, have the, they can think of what they want to say. Now, so that's surface recording in the operating room. The other thing we do a lot of, and Colin just, you know, we just recorded two patients, is we do the intracranial recording for epilepsy patients. And there's two kinds of electrodes. Electrocorticography means the electrodes are on the surface of the brain. Let's say you think the kid's dysplasia is somewhere in the left frontal lobe and you want to try to find it, 
but many seizure foci are coming from deep in the brain, as we'll talk about in the epilepsy part of the course. So we have electrodes, fine wires. You see the very small holes uh, drilled, stereotactically implanted. And you can see this is targeting the hippocampus. This is uh, memory, orbitofrontal cortex. Pick your poison in terms of social, emotional. Cingulate, one of Colin's interests in terms of response selection and monitoring and surprise. And then in some cases, and the case that we just did, at the very end of the electrode, this electrode, you can push out a few fine microwires and in humans actually record single unit activity, which is an amazing development in the last maybe 10 years. What can you do with this? Well, you could do lots of stuff with it because the, this high frequency band signal is extremely robust signal on the surface of the brain. It's only 10 microvolts on the surface of the brain, which means on the scalp it's diminished by 90%. It means it's only a microvolt, so we can't get it in the scalp right now. But when you're on the surface of the brain, it's just, it's just a beautiful signal. And I'll just show you one of our first movies where we did a task called a verb generation task. You're going to do the task. You ready? I'm going to give you an action. I'm going to give you a noun. And I want you to quickly generate for me an action verb. You ready? Ball. OK. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So he, he heard it. He maintained the rule. He implemented the rule. He selected the response, and he said it. And he did it about, in about a second and a half. So let's see if we can track his brain in real time. So this is the brain of an epilepsy patient who's got grid electrodes on. We know if we do fMRI scanning in that task, it's all sometimes used pre-op, we get the expected players in Wernicke's area and Broca's area in motor areas, because you said throwing, right? You've got to get through that at the end. This is what you have, but we don't know what leads what, because it's a six-second delay, right? And remember. The task was done in less than two seconds, much less than two seconds. So here's a patient in action. The white electrodes are where we localize the seizure. So we don't include those, because that's what's surgically resected. What you're going to see, this high-frequency band activity, and this is a two-second movie spread out over 10 seconds. You're going to see he heard it. He implemented a rule. He selected a verb. He, actually, technically, it wasn't a verb. He went to the motor system and drove his articulators, your brain reheard what you said, and his auditory cortex will refire. Here's your brain in action using just this high frequency band response. Onset 200 milliseconds, he heard it, implementing the rule, selecting the response, saying it, refires the cortex. You've just tracked his entire brain in action. Basically, and the entire thing was over in a few hundred milliseconds. And that's the power, that's the power of this intracranial uh, recording approach. So here's what we're going to do when we reassemble. I get a code from people, and everybody says, time to quit. So that's good. I don't have to look at my watch. We're going to continue talking about finishing off the EEG and the intracranial section. Uh, and then we're going to do magnetoencephalography and finish up with a new method that can be used in kids' optical imaging. And at the end, we'll talk a little bit about interesting brain machine applications. Hopefully, we'll be done this week. Maybe not. If not, we'll finish the next week. And then we're going to do the neurological exam. I'm going to examine a patient up here, and you're going to see exactly what to do. Well, they're kind, not really a patient. They're kind of a pseudo-patient. Mano and Colin have kindly agreed to be our neurological patients. So um, all good. See you Wednesday. Like, is that fMRI or EEG? This is direct. No, no, no. It's e, it, this is the electrical recording from the cortex. Oh. This is direct electrocorticography. We're recording electrical activity. It has nothing to do with fMRI. Oh. That's an MRI picture of the person's brain. Oh, okay. But it's actually, I'll, I'll make that clearer next time. Yeah. Well, that's an fMRI. That's oh. fMRI. This is ECOP. ECOP. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah.